about guys and balls and <laughs> dicks. Ah, vaginas, vaginas. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Feminism, yes. <laughs> I met God, she's black and French. <laughs> Misses the worst kind of understanding, random example. My weak knees, rude and weakly peak, sneaks, dinner reservations. I seem less, you catch me. Closed off, close off, bout to fall. Close and broken, bound to cut each other off. Open, breathe, wind, high times. High precious indifference, I'm dazed. Moral polemic emotion station, I love complaining. Changing every word you say in mouse pain, a saliva station, c'est la vie, and salivation. Back to the studio rotation live in three, two, one. Papaya, apply your patience. Whoa. <laughs> that was great. Wow. Dinosaur, what dinosaur would you be?
These are our guests today. I'm so happy to conclude the very last cosmos with two female artists. I have on my right side a Papiche, uh, Bab a Babiche Papaya from Rwanda. I'm so happy to have you here. Hello. <laughs> on one side, you can applaud her. <laughs> And on my left side, I have Mariam Sawiris from Hello. Egypt and also from Australia. And I'm so happy to have you both here. And this was... Thank you. <laughs> this was our introduction to this very last cosmos. It was... I, I'm, it is the very last one this season, or maybe the last one, but I'm very happy. It's a a great farewell because it was two amazing years. We started in 2015 and we are now in 2017 and this is our third show. And tonight we thought the best way to conclude such a political and artistic uh, a series of artist talks is to end with words and we decided to end with spoken words. So we will dedicate the evening to words and to speech, and also to this revolution of uh, bringing performative elements into text and into words, and that spoken word is one of them, is one of these performative arts. And I'm very happy to have both of you here. And we're going to dedicate, we're not going to talk as much in the, as in the other shows, um, because I wanted to be more performative and to give more space into the performance, into the artist. And then after the show, we will continue the party. And I'm very happy to have three other artists that are outside. And we're going to have three DJs who are going to perform very shortly, one after the other, because it's Saturday and everybody's busy, uh, busy and has to run to another party. So <laughs> we, start, <laughs> we start with Grace Kelly, who I love, and Moses Liu, and then uh, another DJ, Divab, who was already here, I think, in the show, uh, show uh, about choreography and dance, and uh, she was already here and um, showing a work. So it's going to be a great night, I think, and, I, and it's going to be a nice farewell. So um, I welcome you both uh, Thank to you. Spoken Word. And I start with the very first question. To, to, to you, why uh, spoken word? How did you come to spoken word? Why did you choose? What was the way, what was the river that you took to get to, I think to, to spoken word? It's because um, I listened to rap music a lot when I was younger. I still do. Uh, and so I, the first things I wrote were mainly like raps in German, but like racism and frustrations. And I was like 11 or 10 or something like that. Uh, and then I stopped writing for a while, and then when I came to Berlin, I went to those kind of open mics and stuff like that. And I was like, okay, I can, I think I can do that. And then that's how I really started writing, and uh, yeah, writing spoken word and raps and stuff like that. Oh. And, and you, so awesome. <laughs> how did you come to? You, you, you said you before you tried spoken word, but you realize it's not, it's not your thing. You prefer to write and compose your music and to bring these words and this text into music. Right? Yeah, basically, like, coming from, like, a musical family, the way songs kind of come is by um, first having, like, a harmony or chords, and then in terms of words, normally the sounds come first, or I'm, like, on the piano, and then I hear this, like, I feel like saying that sound, and then from the sound, I go, oh, we are what we do, and then it kind of creates a, mm -hmm. and then it sometimes molds into a story or um, a, a situation that I... And the word comes to the sound. They come, yeah, the sound is first, and then it kind of makes its way <laughs> to... Mm -hmm. But I always admire uh, uh, rap, and uh, I also listen to hip-hop, and so... Um, 
my sister raps, so sometimes I, I work with her and we do that. But mm. yeah, it's uh, usually a very organic the way the words just kind of come, and then it makes sense afterwards. Mm. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what spoken word. People are still coming, so we just leave the, the noise a little bit. Flow. Um, about uh, spoke, I, w I just wanted to talk a little bit about spoken word that is really a performance that is based on words and um, it has a focus on the oral tradition and uh, it's about producing knowledge through orality and through speech and through rhythm as well. It's about applying rhythm to words. And it has really, it's, it has been very central on the African tradition of, 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 um, of oral tradition, of, of knowledge production, which includes hip hop and rap and jazz that you use a lot in your work, but you also make a fusion of Arabic sounds and fusion with soul and jazz, so it has all these elements. Um, spoken word also includes jazz poetry, uh, poetry slams, uh, traditional poetry um, readings, and as well as comedy routines, and it can include also prose monologues. So it has this very large um, layers of performance and these different ways of performing, and it's very much it has, it's, it's, it's always related with its roots in the African tradition of producing knowledge through orality instead of writing. So it is about bringing um, these performative elements into texts and into words and into speech. And some artists have been calling spoken word as uh, hearing knowledge. And I like that very much, mm -hmm. this idea that you produce hearing knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that you produce earring knowledge? This is, please come in and sit down mm -hmm. and join us. <laughs> it's okay, we are happy. <laughs> yes, the bus sometimes doesn't stop. <laughs> That's why I got the bike. <laughs> Uh, yeah, um, producing hearing knowledge. He hearing knowledge. Yes. Does, it, does it make sense to you? Uh, it does, yeah, definitely. Also, um, in the way of uh, that you're transmitting emotions, kind of, that you wouldn't maybe normally be able to, um, yeah, to transmit. For example, I have this uh, piece where I talk about microaggressions, and it's a very sensitive s subject, and I think in, other, in another form, if I had it as a rap song or something like that, it wouldn't, it wouldn't, work. It wouldn't work at all, yeah, because it needs this kind of wit and this interaction and also seeing people's reaction to it, and yeah, I definitely think it's produ that we're producing hearing knowledge, yeah. Mm. Mm -hmm. And Mariam, for you, does it make sense to you as an artist that you s say, well, I sit in the piano, I compose, I write my songs. You don't write your songs, the songs. It's also this link with memory, you know? uh, that spoken word um, doesn't work with written text, or often doesn't work, but instead with memory and memorizing words, or even better, working through association of words. So it's... Does it make sense for you, this hearing knowledge that you produce? Uh, I think so. Um, it's interesting, this idea about hearing, because you can, might be... Uh, like, for example, uh, when I saw your uh, video, I remember uh, there was one point where you emphasised like, the studio, and I was like, oh, yeah. Like, it really clicked because of this mm -hmm. emphasis on rhythm. And... I feel like it's a play between, yes, this emotion that you're bringing out, but also hearing what comes to you because I, I feel like inspiration comes. I just w also wanted to say that my father is a, a percussionist, a, 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 so he's been playing uh, tabla all around the house, so mm -hmm. this uh, organic kind of rhythm is really um, important in the in the music that I make because... Yeah, often like uh, this, if you work with a good percussionist or a drummer or, you know, even in the songwriting itself, if there's not something that's kind of uh, moving the art, then 
yeah, can kind of fall behind. And I think that's when the words can kind of create, as I said, like the sound comes, the rhythm or the emotion, and then it translates to the words. But I don't know if that makes... Yeah, yeah it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. I think it's also one of these dimensions of spoken word that you... It's really about applying rhythm to words or uh, to add musicality uh, to the sound of words. So, and if you have one word, but you don't say it simply the way it sounds, but if you play with uh, the intuition, you expose and you show dimensions of a word uh, that makes it more comprehensible or that uh, allows you to associate, make associations with other words. And I think this is what, what when we start, um, when we enter the perform performance and performative arts. So it, it really, uh, this spoken word has really, is really based on the aesthetics of word play, of intonation, voice in fact, uh, inflection, adorning words with musicality and with rhythms. And then um, it comes really the question, uh, when does one start and one ends? Because for instance, for you, Babisha, you, you, you rap sometimes, mm -hmm. and sometimes you perform poetry, a spoken word, mm -hmm. and where does the music start? And the performance of words start and the performance of music start. When does one start and the other ends? Or does it have to start and end? How do you, how do you work with that? How do you, I think, do you construct that? I think it's very, it's very fluid. Like, um, and it depends also on priorities. Like sometimes I write something and then the priority is really the rhythm of it. So it's the words feed the rhythm and it's kind mm. of this energy that's going on and going on. And then other times, when I write something, it's more about really what I'm trying to say, and also the, um, the um, how can I say it? the, uh, how the words aren't bendable, how they really take their time mm. and open up a new, um, a new line, a new paragraph, even or where I really let the words breathe and even block the rhythm on purpose. Mm. That's most of the. Um, uh, spoken words stuff is kind of like that, where it's kind of blocking a certain rhythm just to make a point. Whereas when I rap, I really try to keep the rhythm going all the time, all the time. So, yeah. I, uh, with with the music, then it's it's mm -hmm. it's flowing nonstop. Yeah. Also without music, also just the uh, rhythm of the words as such, or mm. of the verse. So. Yeah. You wanted to perform. Yes. <laughs> Yes, I right. did. <laughs> and then, and then Babish, we were very worried where to put the light spot and the microphone. And she said, very cool, oh, I'm going to sit here <laughs> and just perform from the sofa. <laughs> OK. <laughs> but she hurt herself in, a, uh, in an accident, so she's supposed to be stay yeah. sitting. I have an excuse. Definitely. You have a good excuse. <laughs> what? what what are you bringing is sitting on the train? Sitting on the train, exactly. That's the one I was talking about earlier also. Um, it's about, I was on the train with my sister, who's also here today. And, Where uh, is she? Uh, over there on the left. You can stand up. <laughs> <laughs> I think she has to stand up because I think she was, <laughs> she was the filmmaker from the first video we saw. Is that right? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Mama <laughs> Omar. Yeah, so she was with me on the train, and it was, I think, around 3 or 2 a.m. or something like that. And then uh, there was this older white guy who came up to us, and he was like, wow, I really love your fingers. Uh, are you from Ethiopia, I think he said? And I was like, oh, no, that's so creepy. <laughs> and uh, he was like, no, I've been to Ethiopia, and they have beautiful hands. And like, it was just like ranking us in stereotypes or whatever. And then I went home and wrote a poem about it, a piece about it, and it's called Sitting on the Train. <clears throat> So I'm sitting on the train, just minding my business. This guy comes up to me, and you won't believe it. He was really old and really white. He said, you must be Ethiopian, because, man, you look tight. I'm from Rwanda, I corrected. Disappointment in his eyes. My, Rwanda's right after Ethiopia beauty-wise, am I right? 
had to correct that cracker twice. See, as happy as I am to rank as high as I did in your charts of ethnicities, tribes, and tribulations, I couldn't help but notice you failed to mention your name and explanation or some type of bullshit small talk to politely start this inappropriate conversation. You just went ahead. Ich war auch mal in Afrika, ist nicht? Oh, I remind you of the time you visit entire fucking continent. I listen, of course, but in my mind, really starting to wish he just guessed my sign. Imagine life's like a restaurant, right? Well, mine's a Kigali backyard place with rude staff, no debate, and if I was to complain, let's say, to the waiter, excuse me, I think there's been a mistake. I asked for sexism, not racism. You eat what's on the plate. <laughs> That's what he'd say. Now back to the train. It's the middle of the night, right? It's the middle of the night, right? It's the middle of the night, right? It's the middle, it's the middle, it's the middle of the night. So on the train in the night at 4.30, I'm analyzing this metaphor thoroughly. So the waiter is society, obviously. Oh, Mr. Racist pickup line here on the opposite seat, but he sure as hell ain't me. But see, the thing is, occasionally, it's that self-hating assimilated part of me telling me to calm down, not make a scene, or that it really ain't that big of a deal. Having realized my own advice, suddenly, nothing on the menu quite soothes mon appetit, neither sexism nor racism I'm willing to eat, and especially not that exquisite mixture of both. <laughs> It's just beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot. <laughs> you want to go ahead, or should we move mm -hmm. on? Yeah. Uh, or you want to tell tell about it? Uh, about the next one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so the next one is in German, and it's about gentrification, um, sort of. Um, yeah, and I think you'll get it. Um, okay. <laughs> um, die Stadt in Gold getränkt, der Nebel glüht. Rosella Pfandlady war eben hier, überraschend Pfandflaschen abholen. Die eine schien angewidert und unterhalten von ihrer Armut. Früher haben sich Leute bei meinem Vater, Pfarrer, Stiefvater Essensmarken abgeholt. Wer Mitleid seht, erntet halt, Arro Wer Mitleid seht, erntet halt Arroganz. Stadt verliert Licht und gewinnt Glanz. Laterne auf Pflasterstein, Schnee auf Kieselstein Laterne auf Pflasterstein, Kieselstein auf Schnee auf Stolperstein, Schwamm drüber. Schwarz an Kosti, Kottis Küsten gespült, Brennpunkt, Sand drüber. Heizt sich nur auf, um wieder abzukühlen. Adern aus Asphalt. Ich und meinesgleichen verstopfen die Straßen des Stadtstaats. Stadtstart, Countdown zum Herzinfarkt. Du bist Berlin und du bist krank. Thank you so much. It's so beautiful. Thank I'm really you. happy that you're both here. There's so many talent people that we should bring here every month again and again. It's really beautiful. Um, I think it's a good moment to go back to Mariam and also to talk about the Egypt revolution. We and we have some slides. Noam, uh, can you just let them roll? And, um, you came from a nomadic family yep. in Egypt, and then your family left to Australia, and where you grew up. And then in 2013, during the the Arabic uh, the Arabic Revolution in the Egypt Revolution, you went back to uh, Egypt, and you were part of this revolution. You've sent us some photos. You are here with your small little right, brothers and sisters. Yeah. Yeah, that's and this is your family. And um, this was a very important journey uh, for you to go back to Egypt, and especially to this time of, of transition and of revolution. How much did that influence you and your work? How much that became present in your work? And well, I have to be honest and say that um, I have a very like I had a unique position in the sense of being Egyptian because okay we grew up with molkhia and arabic food and arabic music and we're very much I lived with my grandparents and um so 
I felt like we were in Australia, but we were very Egyptian in the house and mm. so different there. And then we used to go back. And Egypt kind of transformed from 2009 to 2013. We saw a shift in the energy of people. People were much more happier when I went when I was 15, when, when, when I was uh, going there earlier when I was younger. And you saw the shift in people and the happiness shifted. The revolution was really in, uh, was such an intense uh, moment for me because um, to see a whole country stop and everybody, it didn't matter if you were Muslim, if you were Christian, if you were Jewish, if you were old, if you were, uh, everybody was supporting and going in this direction to take down the, the regime. And um, so to see this unhappiness build and then everyone fight for something, this was really profound. There were so many people on the streets and people angry, but also people happy and celebrating with music, yeah, you know, like yeah, the tracks and everything. It's like, oh my God, it's crazy. It's turn around, my mom's crying. It's a really emotional time. I never seen, I still have never seen anything like this before. I think um, for me personally, it shifted because like, it was like, wow, I can't believe that, that it's possible that so many people can be focused towards a, a common goal and a good goal because it was against this, let's call it the evil power in a movie or something, but it's, it's true. But also there was a lot of pain and really a lot of pain. People have been suffering for years. That's why my parents decided to grow, uh, to raise us in Australia. My grandparents migrated in the 50s. Um, but then again, the beauty is that we took a trip. The first picture that we saw, just I think before that, we took a trip to Fayum, which is a, uh, that picture. We took a uh, trip, the whole family, so my dad and my mom and my brothers and sisters, big gypsy family, and we went to the desert, which is um, and to a pottery village called Fayum. And there, there were like really a um, uh, village, um, and these people had nothing, and they gave us everything. <laughs> And they let us stay there for free, and they cooked us big meals with what they had, that little you know, garden and stuff like this. And my father turned to me and he said, see, see these people here? I said, yes. And he said, these people here have something that we don't actually have in the West. They have inner peace. And you really need to take this with you when you go. So as much as there's so much shit, sorry, going on around, you kind of realize that it doesn't really matter what's happening. You really have to find this simplicity in mm. what you do and who you are. So I guess, in a way, I move around a lot and sometimes people say, oh, why aren't you, you know, on this cover and doing this and what do you really do for a job and la, 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 and la. And it's like, <sighs> live life and be yourself. Like, that's my, that's a gift that you can give. And that's when you wrote uh, Mama. That's when I wrote Mama, yeah. So at the end, I just wanted to say that my dad helped me translate. There's some Arabic, and it's uh, happiness does not... Happiness lives inside you. Look towards yourself and your God and be content with what you have. Beautiful. And we have one picture, Noam, with uh, your father. Oh, that's... I think, uh, who's uh, a great percussionist. Yeah, who he's you played uh, with also. Mm -hmm. He's... So Actually, my sister's playing cajon. Yeah, corner, <laughs> yeah. she, right my sister's playing cajon, and he's playing tabla, and he played drum kit. Actually, that's how my parents met in a band. He was playing drum kit. My mom sang, and my brother also plays drum kit. Another one, and my sister plays the violin. So it's really nice. So that's what you're going to play now. You're going to play Mama? Lama Bada. Oh, Lama Bada. That's and that's Mama. not my song, but yeah. That's yeah, like that's not your song. That's a traditional Egyptian song. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if it's Egyptian, but yeah, Arabic. Arabic. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna put okay. this down now. <laughs> yeah, we wait until you get there. <laughs> Thank you.
So this song is Lama Bada. I have tried 
<laughs> Mama, Mama. It's a beautiful song. You composed that song. Yeah. It's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> that brings me back. Now I go back to this side and um, talk also about your background. Mm -hmm. um, Babish, you were born in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. It's a country that has have experienced a series of different colonizations. Germany colonized Rwanda in 1884. It was during the Berlin Conference here in Berlin that Otto von Bismarck invited all European countries to join Berlin to sit on a table with a map of Africa on the top of the table. And among themselves, they decided which European country keeps which part of the continent of Africa with a ruler. The continent was divided in seven pieces, one of the pieces to Germany, another piece to the Portuguese. Uh, that's my background. And so on and so on. So Germany colonized Rwanda in 1884 as part of the German East Africa. I have to read this because I find this very important. Then followed by Belgium, which uh, invaded Rwanda in 1916 uh, during the First World War. Both Germans and Belgians ruled, uh, ruled Rwanda for a while and created a hierarchy of races among the Rwanda population, promoting supremacy of the Tutsi, um, defining them as superior towards the others as inferior. So they brought the hierarchization of race, the creation of race and the hierarchization to the African continent and considered the Hutu and Tutsi different races. 
1935, Belgium introduced an identity card similar to South Africa, labeling each individual as a different race, Tutsi, Hutu, Tua, or naturalized. The Hutu population revolted then in 1959 against a supremacist colonial order, and during this year, many Tutsis were killed uh, by Hutus, forcing more than 100,000 people to seek refuge in neighboring countries. Um, in 1962, Rwanda and, and Burundi were both uh, occupied and colonized by Germany and, uh, and, and Belgium. And in 1962, then Rwanda was separated from Burundi and gained the independence. Um, this colonial conflict had its climax in 1994 in the so-called Rwanda genocide in which in 100 years, between 500,000 people and 1 million Tutsi and political moderate Hutus were killed, as well as Twa. And yes, and these are the consequences and the complexities of the colonial history. And, and you portray that in a poem that you called uh, and after the coup. Yeah, and, and after the coup, or the genocide Franco Allemand. Franco Allemand. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit how you came to this yeah. to this to this poem? It's um it's when I first uh, heard about uh, Germany having troops in Rwanda during the genocide. I didn't know about it. I just heard that about it. It was in nineteen ninety four. During the yeah, in nineteen ninety four, the genocide in nineteen ninety four. And um so I wondered, I thought it was very weird that it doesn't reflect at all in media or history or whatever. And then I wondered, what kind of mark do we actually leave, like we, the um, victims of the genocide, do we actually leave in the French uh, history or media and the German history and media? And what kind of, what does that do to language if you kind of um, break it open to show the wounds of colonialism and uh, and genocide, yeah? And so I called it an art to coup because uh, a coup, um, a cow is sacred in Rwanda, and so it's in. Uh, it's kind of a wink to and art to kunst, the art that was considered not uh, um, not legit, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, by the Nazis. Such an underestimate. Uh, and anyways, okay, yeah. So that's why I called it that way. And but but it's important that you say it because I I I, I think. When I was preparing the evening, I thought it's so important to bring back this continuity because we are so used to receive fragmented moments of history and mm -hmm. we don't link, mm -hmm. and we don't see the continuity of mm -hmm. history. And when we speak about the genocide of Rwanda, I think most of the people do not see any implications of Germany in this mm -hmm. genocide mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. of the colonial history or of the Berlin Conference and so on. We are so used to look at facts and the history as uh, a, a, a two minutes, mm -hmm. two minutes sequence of, of, of news yeah. so that you don't really relate one thing to the other. Exactly. And I find this, this very important. And I, I think this is what we can do with art. We can indeed build these bridges mm -hmm. and uh, that are missing to understand uh, our history and to understand why we are now here where we are. Definitely. And, um, because yeah. Because colonialism also reflects in the language a lot. For example, in uh, Kinyanda, uh, we say Ishuri, that's the word for Schule, uh, for school, and it's directly from the German word Schule. So there's a lot of, or my uh, that's the word for like street kids, and it's my boy from out of the German, so I wondered what kind of impact can I, as an artist, make on the language that's kind of um, um, forced onto me. Mm. Yeah, and so it's in French and in German kind of mixed, so if you understand French, uh, good for you. <laughs> okay, um, so I'll just go ahead. Huh? You can go ahead. Entartete kun tartete kent artete Peut-être, peut-être. Étais-tu têtu? Tu tué peut-être. Enquête and artet. T'as tué tata. Mais écoute, c'est bon, hein? Ça va? <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Thank you, thank you. It's a very short poem. It's very short. Very precise yeah. for a very complex history. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Because we're expecting more. Yeah. I wanted it really to be dense, like syrup almost. Like, oh. And it comes like a game with, with, with sounds more than with words. And you, it's very beautiful because you put together a lot of different colonial language together in this poem. Mm. And you jump from one colonial language to the next. And, mm. and I like that came through. It's also funny, that one verse, uh, Tatui Tata, it means like, uh, you killed my aunt, basically, but it's also Tatui Tata, Tatui yeah. Tata, basically, and it's, uh, it's playing with sounds. And, uh, <laughs> Money's tight? No. Yeah, Is okay. it later? Uh, uh, no, I can do it now. Ungeduld. Uh, ungeduld. Yeah, ungeduld. Uh, yeah, the next one is in German again, and it's a uh, way, uh, such a, it's an easier topic. Um, it's about when uh, somebody doesn't text you back, and you're like, oh man, <laughs> I really like you. Uh, uh, so it's called Ungeduld. <coughs> okay. Ungeduldig bin ich, bin ungeduld, nur am Stottern. Kennst du keinen Bock haben, sich in Orten aufzuhalten, ohne WLAN zu begeben? Ich sehe die blauen Häkchen, hast die Nachricht wohl gelesen, wenig griffig. Bin geschrieben, wenig witzig. Zwei Emojis war zu viel, drei Punkte zu suggestiv. Im Selbstgespräch recht wortgewandt, zu zweit nur so mit Fuß und Hand. Dach schreibt zurück, ich bin gespannt, Gummiband, ungeduld. <lacht> You want to continue? Uh, no. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we keep the we keep the money tight for the end. Can I do, can I just say like yeah. I, I mean I didn't I don't understand German that well, but I really love the way you play with sounds, like just on point, like the way like yeah, it's just <laughs> beautiful the way you construct it. It's so important, like sound, music, like the way you love it. <laughs> Thank you. Money's tight or? Uh, money's tight, we, we keep to the end, okay. right? Mm -hmm. You said you wanted to the end. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I go to Mariam. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we continue the, 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 the Africa, African journey. And then after you left Egypt during uh, 2013, during the revolution, mm -hmm. then you, you made a, a very long journey to Tanzania and to Kenya and Uganda. And that was a very important uh, journey for you. Actually, that whole Sanzibar. year we were traveling around Europe. We went, my mom was crazy. She took uh, the kids out of high school and just, we're going this way. And I was like, I just come back from Japan and I was like, I'm coming with you. Like, <laughs> And I wasn't expecting to go to Africa, but it was the best, best uh, decision. Mm -hmm. The, the song I was singing is called Africa and it's really short and actually releasing it really soon. We recorded it, but yeah, it's a very short song, but I can play it for you if you want. Yes, please. Yeah.
you so much. It's fun, especially when there's some drums with me. The funny thing. Yeah. Where did you compose it? In Hamburg, actually. When you come back. <laughs> Last year in Hamburg, I was missing home, and I thought, man, my mom's cool, like taking us to Africa. And I was just thinking about her, and I had F major, uh, G major, and F major. And I was just going through the chords, and I said, damn, gonna get the guy. But yeah, I, I got it. I got a song. Hey, I got a, oh, hey, I got a song. <laughs> so, yeah. And then came the lyrics. Yeah, and then, the yeah, it's gonna do that, gonna, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's beautiful. Um, this brings us to the point where, where I have to remind you why we are here <laughs> and why we were here doing two years and what we did and why we, we have this title, Cosmos Square, Cosmos Ortsfrei. Um, I have to remind you that it was Alexander von Humboldt who um, named his very famous lectures, Cosmos, after his colonial journeys to Central America. He went to Central America with the task of describing the world, describing the cosmos, classifying plants, animals, people, topography, geography. And it was, of course, funded and paid by the Spanish royalty because the Spanish had great interest on, um, on having more information about Central America to continue the colonial exploitation. And brings, that brings us to mind how science and knowledge production is very closely linked with capitalism and colonization, so, and how um, um, not universal, how, how not objective, how uh, not uh, impartial it is. But back to the story of Alexander von Humboldt was he returned to Berlin to describe and to give great lectures about all the information that he collected and classified and defined in his journeys. And he did his collections, I think he was maybe considered a kind of a pop star for the times, who brought information that nobody had. And he used to give these lectures in the Singh Academy uh, Berlin. And the Singh Academy Berlin is exactly the Maxim Gorky Theater where we are here today. It's the same institution, the same physical space, the same house. And then one day I received this beautiful call, a call from Shermin, uh, who's the director of this beautiful theater, and said, uh, uh, Grada, you have to come and you have to do something. Uh, and in this space, because at the time they started or were already building the Humboldt uh, Forum, which is on the back of you in front of us. On in front of you in the back of us is the Humboldt University, and we were talking about this geography and this commemoration of the Umbol, of Umbold. And we, uh, the Maxim Gorky Theater is surrounded by a geography, surrounded by Umbold and statues and, and houses and universities and forums. So what do we do with a house, with a space that has this legacy and where this kind of colonial knowledge have been produced and celebrated? And how can we occupy this space anew? How can we occupy and appropriate spaces and transform spaces through uh, emancipative knowledge production, through new configurations of power and of knowledge. And this is how we came to this. 2015 was also a very critical time for Europe that showed European crisis on migration and on uh, the competence to deal with diversity and so on and so on. Many people were crossing from the Middle East, crossing Europe to arrive uh, in Germany. And uh, it was something very, very uh, imminent. It was something very urgent that we wanted to do something. And then came this idea of doing the Cosmos Square where we occupy this space and exactly produce 
knowledge that is emancipatory knowledge that is produced by people who have been made objects and now become the speaking subjects who have been invisible and now become visible who have not been having a platform to speak and to show their art and they come and occupy this space so we wanted to work with artists who were forced to flee home and and forced to cross borders and became refugees and many times do not have the documentation to cross small borders inside the city to come here. So that should be the platform. And the platform should also be a not, a, not about telling their personal story and their biography and how many disasters and, and pains they had to go through, but actually to bring the artist here to give us an insight into their artwork and how do they work as expertise and as competent artists. So um, then I, I continued speaking and I spoke, then we continued this dialogue with Shedman and with Nechati, with Monica. I said, I don't want questions and answers. I hate questions and answers. We have to create a space without this possibility of aggression because questions can very often be aggressive and many times when people usually are not seen and are usually not listened to and bring knowledge that is not normative knowledge and have no normative biographies are questioned immediately. And I said, no questions, no conversations. We have to create a space where people come and learn to listen for one fucking hour. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's how... So, this is how we came to this, and I'm so happy. I, I learned so much from so many people. It was beautiful. It was always packed with beautiful people like today, and I'm really happy we did this. It was a wonderful time. And I think this brings us, the description of what the cosmos is, brings us very uh, to the point to show the next video of Babish that it speaks exactly about and the ownership of language and how we have to transform language and how we can, through performance and through arts, transform dominant colonial languages and appropriate them, transform them, and make them into uh, languages of resistance. So um, we're going to take a look first. Mm -hmm. Or you, you, would you like to talk about it before? Uh, no, it's just one thing. Uh, yeah. that the language I'm using in uh, the video, it's basically like slang. It's a mixture of like Turkish and Arabic words and German slang. And it was part of a project that I did at Baras Nani Yes. And it was a sort of this... The Kids Mona Chow, no, no, Kids which Mona is Chow. very beautiful. Yeah, it's really such a great project, really. Um, and yeah, it's uh, uh, the theme was Kids Deutsch. And I thought of uh, doing this video sort of like taking words again, taking them apart, and just having the sound of words change the meaning. Luck. Yeah. Luck, 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 luck. Maruk, 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 Maruk. Thank you. 
Tschüss. Alter, du siehst Bom, 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 be. aus. An. Lan. 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 Todes Hübschmann. Killer. Opfer. <laughs> It is just beautiful. It's what you always like. It, 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 you really have, I was writing down, you have Maruk, Alta, Tisch, Kras, Alta, Kumpel, Bomba, sehr gut. Todes hübsch, sehr hübsch. Like a, a dictionary at the end. It's beautiful. Cool, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> How did you come to this project? How did you come to this? Yeah, um, um, yeah well, I... Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> How did you, How did you develop this, this, this work? Uh, it was really a pretty spontaneous idea, actually. Mm. I, uh, um, Because at Thirst, I, uh, I had participated in some other Kitsumona shows also, but um, then this one I thought it could become a bit corny, you know, because it wasn't, I don't normally speak a lot of slang or Turkish words or Arabic words, so I was very afraid of doing like this really corny bit about like, mm. so I do speak, you know? And so I thought, okay, I, I might just go in with an open mind and then really look at the words the way they sound to me, and then, yeah, and then I came up with that. Yeah. Yeah, it's beautiful. Okay. It's very beautiful because it brought uh, me a little bit this uh, thought of um, what do you do when you grew up with colonial languages that, of course, are very racist, uh, very rich in sexism, homophobia, etc., where the language sometimes... Then comes for me the question sometimes how you don't know how to use a language that is your language mm. because you are placed as the other mm. inside your own language and it becomes so, such a dilemma mm. how to, to work with it. And I, sometimes for me it kind of raises this question, I don't know sometimes if I speak a language or if the language speaks me. Mm. Mm. And, and, and I think when you work with language and you, you always in this dilemma of how to use and how far. And one of the powers of spoken word is exactly to be able to break down and to transform the language. Mm -hmm. So it has this element of empowerment and of resistance that I find very, very beautiful, that yeah. you break it down and you transform it and you put it opposite and you give another meaning to things. Mm -hmm. um, um, so that people can understand the word, but they don't know. It's very irritating because they understand the word, but they don't know what it means. And we have the same in Criolo. We have Criolo in Cabo Verde, and we have Criolo in, in São Tomé e Príncipe, and Criolo is based in Portuguese, like other Creoles in French and so on, or the Patois in English. And we use the colonial language, but it's used, displaced in order of the sentence, so that you understand each word, but you don't understand what is being said. And that is the game of it, that you don't know what it means, even though you understand. Uh, choose, alta, bomba, but you don't know what it means in that exact, in this sequence. And this game of words, I find it very powerful in spoken words. A sort of disguise also, like a disguise in words, you know? You yeah, yeah. Hide behind them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you know, we are ending the evening, and we are going to have one more time Mariam uh, playing a very beautiful song called Lately, 
And then we're going to have Pabish performing one beautiful poem called, uh, it's, it's getting tight. Money is tight. Money is tight. <laughs> <laughs> and then before it gets tight, we go outside and we have Grace, Kelly, and Moses Liu, and Ishab pay, uh, playing great music for us to dance for a while. And, and then we say goodbye. I'm, I'm really happy. Um, do you, you want to, to go to Lately? Do you want to tell us about Lately? Because you wanted to perform this one at the end. You said yeah. you liked this one very much. Well, I think um, oh, Lately. <laughs> I, I think it's just my gut feeling tells me it's about being very sensitive, highly sensitive and that everything's really fast and everything's really fast paced and everyone's going and doing their thing and and kind of people following like everyone kind of doing what everyone's doing or they have like um a career or they have to do tend to this and sometimes it's really hard to stop and listen to yourself and feel good feel inside so i think that lately came quite organically just from sounds and it's just about the struggle at the begin at the beginning but at, at the end of the song i kind of resolve it and just realize you just got to do what's right for you that's basically the message i think mm. so yeah. um go <laughs> Later for you Are we gonna hear the truth Everybody hearing you Everybody going down the same track I got all the way And then hey Are we gonna see the day uh, Hey you're getting yourself In a nasty situation Don't like what you see You're getting so frustrated Straighten So frustrated, straighter, straighter, you're getting so frustrated. Ah, 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 again, again, my family come, is ready to explode. the 
Later by the time we not take step two Think we percussion later for you And we gonna hear the truth Everybody here you Everybody going down the same track We got all the way and then hey And we gonna see the day Listen to you the whole night. <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we have the last word to you, Babisha. Thank you very much. Um, so the uh, it was really really nice you singing. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, the last one is called "Money's Tight," and it's about different ways of traveling. So um, in the poem or in the rap, I. Uh, um, I compare somebody just taking a flight, basically visiting a friend, and somebody uh, crossing the ocean, swimming, and trying to get uh, to Europe. Yeah. Okay. Money's tight, book a flight that is closer to me, because I can. You swim, bring two bikinis, not sure what shore is closer to thee. Don't forget to breathe, arm wrestle the sea. Fight fright, stroke right, turn left before Greece. Homeland, Brody on TV, I tilt back my seat. Heart beats, waters beats, borders beats me. It sounds like a Nike ad, we're both selling dreams. Dark as night, Jordan, Mike, why shouldn't we? Jump just as far in high hundred degrees. You need those to paddle, I'm a whole your stories and write about struggle from my window seat deep I, I, I could listen to you the whole night too I hope we you will have many many platforms so that many people will listen to both of you and to many other people who are here, definitely. I want to thank you all for being here, for have been here since two years. It's been a great audience, very dedicated and lovely. I want to thank the team of Studio Ya and Itshati. It's been so beautiful to be here. Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you so much, Sylvia. 
and Monica and Sylvia and all the technicians that every time I come there's someone new but it's always great and <laughs> and um, and I want to thank everybody and you know I wanted to try to tell all the names of the people who were here because some of them are not here anymore and had to be the porters and some are here some are far away because they cannot cross uh, states inside Germany to come here. So I'm going to try to say all the single names of the participating artists that were here since in the last two years. But I want to remind you, just to give you a, a chronology of the great things we did. We, this is the 13th uh, show, but we started the first with knowledge the second with film, the third with music, the fourth with performance, fifth activism, six fine arts, seven dance and choreography, eight literature, nine it was a party, <laughs> <laughs> then the tenth video installation, eleventh illustration and visual arts, twelfth photography and today's spoken word. And the participants, um, before I tell the participants, still people from the team, that I have to thank, that are outside the team, but the team, is Uta, our beautiful photographer that was here every, to in every show, Ezra, who's the other photographer who did the postcard, and Patricia, who is the filmmaker who did the trailer of, uh, of the videos. Now I go to the participating artists. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. so, I want to thank really from my heart because not everybody's here now all the participating artists who made Cosmos possible and beautiful Sina Atahendena a filmmaker from Iran Richard Jimeli a filmmaker from Cameroon Lian Kalaf, a musician from Syria. Samir Ula, a musician from Pakistan. Marta Fesiatsion, an actress from Germany, Ethiopia. Michael Edod Ojak, an actor from Nigeria. Sara Iruth Zidvi, an actress from Germany, Ethiopia. Moses Leo, an actor from Germany, South Africa. Elizabeth Blonzen, an actress from Germany. Amze Bitici, an actor and activist from former Yugoslavia, Romania. Elizabeth Ngari, an activist from Kenya. Rula Ali, a fine artist from Syria. Osama Zatar, a fine artist from Palestine. Kave Gahemi, a dancer from Iran. Diva Magi, Who's going, Magay, who's going to be the DJ today, dancer and LGTB activist from Lebanon. Said Hahid El Monen, choreographer and dancer from Morocco. Bino Biansi Biakuleka, a writer, designer and activist from Uganda. Rasha Abbas, a writer from Syria. Milo Knefati, a musician from Syria. Cage, the brothers Pritzeri, musicians from Germany and Romania. Diana McCarty, a radio moderator and activist from the US. Tasnim Baghdadi, an illustrator from Morocco and Germany. Moshtari Ilal, illustrator from Afghanistan. Mohamed Lamin Jadama, photographer from Gambia. Krishna Krishan Rajapaksha, a photographer from Sri Lanka. Babish Papaya, a spoken art, word artist from Rwanda. And Maria Swaides, a musician poet from Egypt, and my name is Grada Kilomba, and thank you so much.
And now it's party time. <laughs>